Good evening, my Trues Clues aficionados. I hope you all are doing well out there today, taking care of yourself, looking out for each other, looking out for yourself first, keeping your eyes open, ready to say something if you see something. So I did want to reach out to you today and give you my latest story that I've been researching. And oh my gosh, I've had so many technical difficulties with the last two episodes that I've been trying to record. Um, it's really throwing me off my game. I'm not get, I'm running behind to getting my episodes out. Um, I tried a little bit of, you know, different camera techniques there. And of course, trying to learn what you're doing and the error and whatever of getting that through <clears throat> has really been a lot of fun. That is for real. And then this one, um, I tried to record outside. It was really beautiful out there, but the creek behind me that I was using for my backdrop was so loud, it just totally overlaid everything that I was saying. So um, then I came in the house and I recorded an episode. I used my cameras to do that when I usually use my phone and my laptop. And then I couldn't get the stuff transferred over to my laptop for whatever reason, the, uh, what do you call it, that jacking station portal station whatever it's called wasn't working for me so i guess that's the way it goes so here i am recording it again got myself a little bit of wine this time because that was definitely a trying situation today and trying situations is what i want to talk to you about today basically i want to talk about some more crazy mama stuff going on here and um, this was really a high profile case. Uh, YouTube was really saturated with it. So I really didn't want to do a story on it. I guess I should. I don't know. I never know what to feel about that. Um, but there was just so much out there about what was going on with this chick. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wait for a while and see what happens. So with that being said, oh no, I see a hair poking out there on my side. It's making me crazy. Anyway, with that being said, I want to talk about Lori Vallow, then Lori Vallow Daybell. And apparently she turned out to be rather a nice lady initially. Um, she was a um, little blonde girl, grew up in, you know, with family support. Seemed like she was pretty happy. Um, she was a Latter-day Saint person, I think, pretty committed to being that religion as well and adhering to the ideology that they had to offer to her. And um, she had a little girl, her name was... Tylee. And uh, Tylee and her met this man by the name of Charles Vallow. And she was really looking for somebody to take care of her, somebody that was a good to be a good provider to her. And I think somebody that would, you know, provide enough that she wouldn't really have to work or she could just dabble in whatever it is that she wanted to do. So with that being said, um, what she wanted to do was to have a podcast. Her and a lady, I believe, by the name of Melissa or Melanie, um, they started this podcast about spiritualism and their views on religion and whatnot. And um, so I'm not sure what all was done there or said there. But anyway, um they got on there and Lori, which I do believe was displaying some narcissistic tendency, was saying that, hey, you know, um, I am in personal contact with this angel and he's giving me one-on-one -on -one spiritual guidance. And this guy was named Navarral, Navarali, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it has anything, date, you know, based in the Mormon Latter-day Saints background, you know, that she would be making a reference to this angel name. Um, I've done angel work. I know there's a lot of angels out there, but I'm not familiar with it in the angel work that I've done myself. So apparently this angel was stepping up, you know, and giving her all of this spiritual guidance and attitude too at the same time. And so they do these podcasts and she's on the internet looking away, trying to find out some new information. And I think at the same time, the, you know, um, gleam of the marriage or the shine of the marriage was beginning to lose its, you know, a little bit of the shine. She may have been feeling a little um, 
like everyday life, not feeling special or whatever it is, you know, that was going through her head. Plus, she wanted to be challenged on a more spiritual level from her partner, somebody that was going to take her beyond where she was, not necessarily where she was. So um, I guess that's the reason for the podcast and everything that was going on there. <clears throat> So then um, she goes ahead and um, she's saying, you know, offering these bits of advice during the uh, podcast, you know, while this angel told me this is what I think. And when I'm out of body, I've had these experiences. And there were some metaphysical references in there, but there was some shit that was crazy. And so um, while she's out there looking around on the internet, trying to find like-minded people, there was a Armageddon doomsday writer, a man who used to be a trash man who is now writing books about Armageddon and doomsday. And according to him, there was going to be, you know, the Armageddon and there was only going to be a few people that were going to be able to survive Armageddon. And I think it was like only 112 people that were going to be able to make it or 111,000. I don't remember quite the number because I thought it was quite ridiculous. Anyway, so these people are going to be able to make it and everybody else, you know, out of the question. Not that we haven't heard that in certain organized religions before. It's there, but I don't know if the numbers are that small, according to this Chad Daybell. Well, the two of them met together, they hooked up, and they just totally hit it off. I mean, the sparks were flying the clothes were flying they were both married to different people but that did not stop them for one minute you know from pursuing their desires and getting what they wanted so pretty soon they're chit-chatting over the internet the next thing they're sexting to each other and then they finally make you know time to be together and they sneak off and they go to hotels and they do this over a period of time and while this is going on, I'm sure that, you know, they're discussing their um, religious ideology at the same time, which is a bunch of crazy horseshit. So um, they eventually, they get it together and they're like, hey, we need to be together. And they're like, um, yeah, we should be together. Well, well, before all of this happened, um, she had basically been like according to family and friends just the most wonderful person ever she had signed up and did uh mrs uh blah 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 beauty pageant queen and um she was also known as being the best mom being quite devoted to her family and just you know doing all the things that wonderful family members and wives do that just get that title so she's out there doing her thing, but I think in the same part, she's feeling unfulfilled. You know, you see that in chicks who go out with, you know, the wrong guy or maybe the criminal or run off with them or whatever. Um, and then it turns out, you know, they were looking for like some excitement or something, you know, to pump up the old lifestyle. I think that that was going on with Lori in a way too. Plus she had narcissistic tendencies as well. They were just kind of her and Chad feeding off of each other, blah, blah, blah. I know you too. Oh yes. Oh yes. I agree. Yes. Yes. This is true. You know, this is what's going to happen. That's reality. And poor old Charles out there in left field. I mean, he knows something's going on, but I don't think he understands the, quite the full extent of what is going on as well. So he's up there and he's like, la, 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 la. And then pretty soon, you know, crazy lady is making grousings about him and not getting along. You know, this happens when you want to run off and be with the person that you're having the affair with. And there was some distance going in between them. She was trying to tell Charles that she thought he was a demon. And he was kind of freaking out. He's like, I have no idea what the hell's going on here. Why all of this is happening. And I'm kind of afraid for my kids as well. So he comes home one day. And um, I guess they got estranged at a certain point in time. And he goes over there to check on the kids or something like that. Because there's a video of him calling the police. And Charles. And what was that, that spirit or demon's name? I believe they called him Ned. Ned Schneider, to be precise. 
or 13, Charles was so spooked by Lori's ramblings about the demon named Ned, he called police. What did she say yesterday? She said, you're not Charles. I don't know who you are, what you did with Charles. Their conversation was recorded on the officer's body cam. Okay. So what makes her a danger to herself and she to others? She threatened me, murdered me, killed me. She and threatened to murder you? Yes. In the winter of 2019, the police cam is like, he's like, I'm so worried. I don't know what happened to him. They were supposed to be here. There's nobody here. They haven't answered my call. The garage is empty. I don't know where my kids are. You know, she's been acting so strange lately. She's called me a demon. And according to uh, the old good old, uh, what do you call it? Um, doomsday Armageddon uh, criteria. That's what she was utilizing against him. Little did he know, you know, where this information probably was coming from at that point in time. So, um, there you go. He, uh, he didn't know what to say or what to do. Well, that goes nowhere. And the next time that you hear about good old Charles, it's because Alec, Lori's brother calls and he's like, Hey, you know, there's something going on here. I'm not sure what it is, but, um, I had to kill my brother-in-law. He was trying to assault my sister. And so um, I had to put the pow pow to him and put him down. And that was that. He's no longer here anymore. So then, of course, the police go out to investigate what happened. When they get there, the only person that that's there is Alec. Although the whole family was there at the time of the incident, the only person there now is Alec. So Lori's not there. Tylee's not there. And JJ's not there. And the police are like, Okay, what happened? And so here comes Lori back. They did drop JJ off at school, but Tylee didn't want to go to school. There's no surprise about that, why she wouldn't want to go to school. They end up going back to the house. If you could see how this crazy lady acts, Oh, I'm so sorry that this had to happen. I'm sorry you got to come down. I'm sorry to the whole neighborhood that this is going on. This is terrible. You know, officer, we just moved in here. I don't understand. It's just so, you know, I feel so bad that this is going on right now. I mean, there's literally no emotional remorse, no crying, no tears, um, you know, just um, <laughs> this smile and just, you know, happy um, whether it's a facade or whether it's the truth, it's there. And um, so they're like, what happened? And then she tries to say that there was some kind of uh, DV going on. And there had also been some essay in the past. And so there was some uh, head banging going on, you know, verbally between the two of them. I don't know. If, I think she also said that he was getting a little abusive because she would have to say that in order for the brother to like step in, you know, and adamantly defend her. And so he steps in and has to f defend his sister in his eyes, he feels. And so he gives the old pew, 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 pow, pow, pow to Charles. And Charles then passes over, crosses the bridge to the other side of, the, you know, the world, the universe, the planes, whatever you want to call it. And so <clears throat> Alex called and he's like very calm about the whole thing. You know, there was a... DV situation. I had to defend my sister. So I had to step in. Everybody saw it. And um, I think at this point in time that Tylee was, you know, starting to freak out a little bit, being like, what the hell's going on here? Because um, she had a younger brother. Um, JJ was seven. He was adopted by Lori and Charles when he was four years old. He was a nephew of, I think, Charles's sister. And so they didn't want anything to do with the kid because he had some extracurricular medical conditions that had to be dealt with. And he had a lot of, you know, extra energy. 
And the grandparents, however, just loved him and loved Tylee just to death. So they suggested to Charles and Lori, because they were younger than the grandparents, if you could adopt the kid and take care of it, help him out, you know, lead him in the right life and being probably a Latter-day Saint as well, it would be a good thing. So they did. And that's what made her a good mom because she was very devoted. She was said to have very much patience. She never lost patience. She never got aggressive with this kid or anything like that. So, all of a sudden, tables turn when you start dating a guy. That's the Doomsday Armageddon book writer. And so, then all of a sudden, your current husband turns into a demon. Knowing that something was going on with the crazy lady, Charles changed his beneficiary odor over. He was like, oh no, I don't know what this crazy lady is up to, but I got to do something. So, he changes his beneficiary out of her name into both the kids' names. So when she found that out, she was just so depressed. She was depressed as hell. And you can hear her in a little conversation that she had with old, what's his name, uh, Chad. You know what? I'm so disappointed. I really thought I was going to get that, uh, those funds and get to do what I want to do with it. But it didn't work out that way. And he's being, you know, like very supportive. Yeah, I know. It's too bad. It is going to make us harder for us to do what we want to do. But we'll figure out something to do. We'll work it out. It'll be fine. You know what I mean? And so when they're talking like that and they also sexed each other, I can't wait. I guess can't wait to talk to you. And hopefully if we start talking, it'll lead to more than just talk. You know, for them, I'm sure it was hot and spicy. And so um, she's like, yeah, you know. About the lead to just gently kiss you for hours. It would likely lead to other activities. Likely or luckily, it would luckily lead to nakedness. The insurance company saying, but I am not the beneficiary. It's a spear through my heart. This is... Um, I'm really disappointed over this. So I don't know what, you know, we're, we're going to do. We're going to have to come up with something else. So in the meantime, during this going on and stuff like that, she's starting to grouse about JJ and Tylee and telling her friends that she thinks they're a zombie. Because remember, in the Doomsday Armageddon book, whoever's left over and is not part of the chosen crowd is then going to be turned into one of those zombie creatures. And then she starts talking shit about how, you know, the kids are going to be that way too. And no, 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 me, me, me. So they're like, okay, um, don't know what's going on here, but you know, it does sound a little odd. Well, um, uh, Christmas time, the last picture that you see of JJ is when he's got these red and white pajamas on and it's Christmas. I don't know. He's involved in doing something um, very interested. He's kind of got his face covered up, but apparently that's the last picture that anybody saw of him. The picture of Tylee, they had went on a family trip and it was her and she looked beautiful. So cute. And that supposedly was the last picture of her. And then after these two incidences, the kids were never seen again. So um, she was just going around doing her thing like it's nothing, you know, and um, the grandparents are questioning, you know, where's the grandchildren? We want to see JJ. Where's Tylee? And of course, she has no reasonable explanation for what's going on. She finally says that uh, her co-podcaster has the kids living with her or not living with her staying with her in her state of Arizona and that's why they haven't seen them because the kids are out of state and that maybe worked for a little while but it didn't work for a long time so finally the care the grandparents out of suspicion and need to find out what happened to their grandchildren especially JJ who was the you know um, light of their life they went ahead and they reach out to the police and they're like please go by do a um what do you call it well person check well baby check make sure that jj and tylee are okay so they get there they talk to crazy lady and crazy lady's like me mm, i don't know um they're over there with you know my podcasting co-host and i want to say her name is starts with the name i'm really terrible with names but that's where she's staying. That's where they are. That's why you haven't heard from JJ because he's over there out of state with that lady. So the cops are like, okay. So they reach out to the lady. And at first the lady says, yes, everything's fine. You know, it's good. And then she thinks about it and she's like, whoa, hold on. 
I maybe have, you know, stepped into something that's not going to be a good deal here. I need to backtrack and figure out what the hell's going on. So her next conversations with Lori, I guess she start recording these phone calls. And then she confronts Lori, you know, why are you trying to throw me under the bus? You know, the baby's not here. Why are you trying to say that? You know, the cops are going to look to me and I don't know why you're trying to drag me into it. Well, I had to come up with something. She's like, <laughs> you know, she's got this Barbie, ethylene, plastic, stupid, want to slap your face kind of attitude whenever she gets questions about the kids. No, 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 it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Don't you worry. It's all great. And she just acts stupid about the whole thing. I'm going to place the video recording here. I've got a few recordings to play. And so after listening to that, she takes this to down to the police and she's like, hey, something has to be up here. I know something is up here because this is not right. Why is she saying the kids are here? No. Melanie Gibb wasn't forthcoming to the police, but 12 days later, she made a call to Lori and Chad and secretly recorded it. It is JJ safe? Here, safe and happy. Chad said they couldn't tell her where JJ was for her own security. Melanie handed that secret. It's all great. And she just acts stupid about the whole thing. I'm going to place the video recording here. I've got a few recordings to play. And so after listening to that, she takes this to down to the police and she's like, hey, something has to be up here. I know something is up here because this is not right. Why is she saying the kids are here? Nobody's seen them. What's on? So evidently, while all of this is going on, Chad is busy getting his own, you know, getting his groove on over there, too. He's got a wife by the name of Tammy Daybell. They have been married for 30 freaking years. And looking at the pictures, they look like they get along. Okay, I mean, you can't really read a lot into it, but apparently they had been, you know, like a nice little family. They did have two sons. And um, so one day the whole family's there and the kids are in their house or in their rooms. They're, everybody's at home in the house, but the kids are in their room. The parents are in their bedroom. All of a sudden you hear like this, ah, and this like, you know, thud to the ground. I mean, it was startling to the kids and the boy got up and he went to the parents' room to find out what happened. And there's Tammy laying on the cat uh, on the bed halfway on the bed halfway on the floor and she is expired i mean she is no longer here and he's freaking out and the husband's acting like he's freaking out and he's like yeah we got to get help here i don't know what happened she passed away um she's not here anymore but let's see if we, we can't get help here so when help gets there they're all about saying oh yeah you know hey this was natural um, we're not sure what happened, but we're pretty sure that there's no signs of anything to show that we needed to conduct an autopsy. So boom, no autopsy, memorial service, Tammy's in the ground. Her benefic benefits are paid off to Chad, who then uses this money to take Lori to Hawaii, where they get married and celebrate their beautiful union out on the beach and just, you know, videos of them having a good time and getting married and being in love and you know like after Tammy had passed away um Chad went to his family now about two three weeks later and he's like you know what I just met the love of my life I'm glad I don't have to be alone for the rest of my life this lady got me she got me bad I'm just rolling in it and the family's like what what are you talking about and he's like yeah this is it. I'm in love. I'm bringing her over for you to meet her. And they come over, you know, he brings her over. They're acting, oh, yeah, you. And they're just so into each other, they can barely even have a conversation. So they go ahead and they fly out to Hawaii. They tie the knot with rings that Tammy had already moved on. We asked him how he was doing, and he said, actually, I'm doing really good. And that he'd met the woman he was going to marry. Did you find, uh, did it surprise you that he seemed to be doing so well? Yes, we were shocked. Alice and her husband, Todd Gilbert, met Lori shortly after. They came to the house and his arm was around her and 
She was giggling and laughing, and they looked like teenagers. Alice says the conversation turned to children. Then Chad said, and she recently just lost a daughter. A very weird and uncomfortable position, and I really did not know what to do. At first, Melanie Gibb wasn't forthcoming to the police, but 12 days later, she made a call to Lori and Chad and secretly recorded it. Is JJ safe? He is safe and happy. Chad said they couldn't tell her where JJ was for her own security. <laughs> Melanie handed that secret recording. <laughs> Then Lori's sister online prior to Tammy expiring. So you tell me. Let me tell you again. Rings Tammy ordered online before Tammy had expired. These are the rings that they used to get married in Hawaii with the money that Tammy's expiration paid Chad as a beneficiary that he then used to take Lori out to ha uh, Hawaii and marry her. And when that happened, his kids were pretty much young adults by then. Um, they didn't even mention the fact that Lori had two children at the time of their wedding. So there's a big suspicion right there. One, why wouldn't you have your kids at your wedding? Two, where are the kids then? And three, why did you never just tell your newly bewedded stepchildren that you have children of your own? So apparently, um, right before all of that, they were out on some little holiday or whatever around that time or during their honeymoon. And they were talking to some lady that they met that was just a kind stranger. And Lori had mentioned to that kind stranger that her daughter had died. Okay. So they say that's one of the few, you know, mistakes that they met, made out there, few of their F-ups. So then, um, you know, everybody's suspicious. The family's trying to support her, but they're trying to figure out at the same time what happened to the kids. And she really has no answers. That's the most frustrating thing when you listen to her and her ridiculous conversation. She just mimics them and they're concerned. I'm so concerned about the kids. Well, so am I. I wonder why, where they are. Well, I do too. It's so ridiculous. How could you be so ridiculous? And with her son, it's just heartbreaking. He's begging her to tell him, please, what is up? I want to know. Well, I wish I could tell you. I don't know. I want to know just as much as you. You know I care about the kids too. <clears throat> I'm breaking that son's heart. He'll never be the same. Even though he tries to care about his mom, he knows really the truth of what happened. And the only reason that he wasn't more cognizant of what was going on because he was starting his own life, just getting married and having a child and stuff like that. I mean, he was trying to be part of the family, but he was trying to start his own life. And they were trying to keep a little distance from the crazy lady at the same time. So then the sister comes in and confronts her and asks her what's going on. And please tell me if there's something that happened to the kids. And no, there's nothing to say. I didn't do anything. It's, you know, it'll all be worked out. They'll be fine. Okay, fine. All right. So while all of this is going on, poor Alex over here, because remember Alex, the poo-poo guy to her um, expired husband, he ended up marrying one of her tight friend circles with her little podcast and their spiritual ideology. He ended up marrying, probably through Lori's suggestion, or at least Lori's introduction, this lady named Lemma. And they were so new to each other, they didn't know anything about each other. And the son that Zulema had knew nothing about this man who just got married and moved into their house. So when the two took off to Hawaii and just blazed up and got married and it was all celebratory and everything, they just totally forgot that she had a brother named Alex. And Alex is like, I can't really understand what's going on here because I just put up, you know, all this spiritual front. I was like a little spiritual soldier for them. And then here I am. I'm more like 
a heel, somebody that's been used by them. I thought I was standing up in the name of God and doing my spiritual beliefs, but no, that's not what's happening at all. They use me like a cheap suit. So he's upset and he tells that Sulema chick, you know, because they're friends and, you know, they are married after all. He said, I thought I had stood up for myself. I thought I was doing, you know, like a good, you know, spiritual person should. Um, but it turns out that I may have been used instead. When she questioned him as to what is going on with that, he really had no questions to respond to after that. And um, she wasn't sure what the hell was going on. He never really did offer any clarification as to what it was either. So not too long after that conversation, um, her son hears something and goes to check in the bathroom. And there's Alex on the floor, totally non-responsive. They call the cops and 911. They call. He's a goner. Nothing to do there. Everybody's thinking, you know, hey, this person probably did something on purpose, knowing that, you know, they were investigating him for the prior crime to see if he was the guilty party or not. And maybe he just decided, hey, this isn't worth all of that. I'm done here. But when everything was said and done, everything was natural. His expiration was natural. It had nothing to do with him initiating it at all. So while that happened and there was no way to get any additional information from this person who would indeed probably start to have remorse over their own actions and what happened. So then um, I'm sure they had to get, you know, whatever subpoenas and whatnot, but they finally got into Alex's phone. And they did the ping ping a wingy and they found out that on the night that supposedly JJ was, you know, last time seen, last time maybe on this earth as a in corporate being, um, that his phone pinged off and it pinged off over to Chad Daybell's ranch, specifically at the Chad Daybell's pet cemetery. So they went over there and they started looking around and they excavated and yes. Yes, they found two decomposing people. One was a male, one was a female, one was very young, one was a teenager, one had been uh, burned up very badly, one had been asphyxiated, and they were both round, bound, bound, bound up in one tarp, plastic tarp, a lot of plastic tarp and sheets and stuff. And the expiration of these individuals was in... Um, accordance to the doomsday apocalypse crazy man's way that you needed to get rid of zombies you either burn them up or you have to um, strangle them and one of each was in place for these children so they're like what the hell because they had confronted the prosecution put on Lori's former friend audrey baratero she delivered some of the most damning testimony of the trial she threatened to kill me okay did she say how? Yes. She said that she would cut me up. Something about that she wasn't in the mental place to do that, but that she would get herself in that place to be able to do it. But that she didn't want to have to because it would be so messy and there would be so, so much blood. And the, the bleach and something about trash bags. But she would very worse. She, no one would ever find me. Audrey Baratero's testimony is critical. Her so many times, she wouldn't answer what was going on. She even finally got put in jail for it and still wouldn't say anything. So when they finally found the children, you know, the truth came forward. And um, Chad was there on the property on the day that it happened. And he's talking to a crazy lady. He's like, I'm getting nervous. I don't know what to do. Things are going to go down. And so he finally gets so nervous, he jumps in his car and he tries to take off. But of course, he's headed off the road. And they're like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You can't be doing that now. We need some answers as to what's going on here. And he had no answers to offer. Um, he gets locked up too. Um, she can't. Uh, go and have her court business taken care of because they keep calling her wackadoo for the longest period of time. So finally, she gets to the point where they call her mentally okay enough to go through her court hearing.
And so when that happens, it is deemed that she is guilty, guilty, guilty on all of those parts. And then they go back and they exhume Tammy because they're pretty sure that there's some kind of connection with this whole web of lies that's been going on. When they do an autopsy on Miss Tammy, they find out that her death was indeed not natural at all. It was by um, induced circumstances. So they were trying to blame Lori for that, but I don't think Lori was even around then, you know, with that whole, when we first tried to deceive, whatever that shit is. But anyway, so it just turns out that, you know, they were just willing to off as many people as they needed to, to get the funds that they wanted to, to go off to do anything they wanted to do. And the persons to pay the price for that are the ones who were under the perception that they were cared for the most. And I, my heart goes out to the Daybell children because um, I'm sure they were completely innocent of all of this and had no damn idea what was going on. Yep, this is where they ended up at. What kind of craziness is that? And with that, my truth Clues aficionados, I wish you a good night. I hope everything is going well for you, and we'll hit to it on the next episode of Truth Clues Crime Scenes. Thank you, and take care. Oh, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. to count two of the amended indictment is Lori Noreen Ballow, not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Tylee Ryan. Answer, guilty. In regards to count four, the amended indictment is Lori Noreen Ballow, not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Ballow. Answer, guilty. In regards to count five of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell? Answer, guilty. Guilty on all. As JJ's grandparents, Larry and Kay Woodcock, exited the courthouse, the crowd outside greeted them by singing JJ's favorite song, We Will Rock You. <laughs> Larry Woodcock had been playing the song while awaiting the verdict. Love always wins. JJ, I love you. Papa, Papa wish you were here. Tylee, Papa loves you. Tammy, you are part of our life. My heart hurts for these three. This is what this has been all about. Why, Lori?